There? No? Okay, we'll try again next week. All right, before I start in, I want to first acknowledge my learned colleague, Rabbi Joe Schwartz, who inspired part of this sermon with a conversation we had about 12 years ago. I also need to say, I need to make this disclaimer, I support everybody's dietary practices. Whether you keep kosher, paleo, if you love barbecued pulled pork, if you're gluten-free, vegetarian, or even, God forbid, a vegan. For those who don't know at home, I'm a vegan. That's a joke. Um, I support all of you. This is not a sermon about how you should eat. This is not a sermon about whether kashrut is right or wrong, how many sets of plates you should have. This is a sermon about Jews bullying other Jews by using the word authentic. And the example I am using to illustrate that is keeping kosher. But this is not a summary judgment on anyone's dietary practices. Agreed? Cool. Okay. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about what I call the authenticity trap in Judaism. What do I mean, authenticity trap? I mean the assertion that there is a correct, authentic version of Judaism that has been practiced in an unbroken, uninterrupted way since our people came out of Egypt and received the Torah at Sinai and a bunch of other stuff. And that a corollary of this, a result of, of this fallacy, is we construct a hierarchy of Jewish observance from the most authentic at the top, who are the ones with the payas and the ones that wear the wigs and the long coats. So the ultra-Orthodox, both the Misnagdish and, and the Hasidish, so the Hasidim and the people with the regular business suits, and then centrist Orthodox, and then modern Orthodox. The joke among the Orthodox is that modern just means not very. Modern, auth modern Orthodox people hate that expression because they are often as or more learned than their Haredi colleagues, busting our myths already. So modern Orthodox, then under modern Orthodox comes DJ people, Saturday people. What's under modern Orthodox in this fallacy of hierarchy? What's under that? Conservative. conservative. And what's under conservative? and Reconstructionist and Renewal, and a post-denominational trans. So there's this hierarchy. Tonight, I'm going to blow up the hierarchy. I'm going to blow up the myth of authenticity. It's not real. I'm going to do that by talking about keeping kosher, also known as kashrut. Why? Why, Rabbi? <laughs> because there is a verse in... This week's portion. Yeah, Ray. Thank you. <laughs> Nicely done, Luz. <laughs> All right. Uh, there, is a there is a verse this week in this week's portion, do not cook a baby goat in its mother's milk, which is considered to be one of the foundational verses for the separation of milk and meat. You will notice it does not say don't eat milk and meat together. We'll come back to that in a minute. I also am talking about this because I am someone who grew up eating pork, who went through a phase of keeping very, very kosher. I was very kosher. How kosher were you? Okay, for those keeping track, halav Yisrael, only bishul Yisrael tuna fish, only, only ovens where a Jew had lit the pilot light on the oven. Very kosher. Now, I don't do any of that stuff, but I am a vegan, which I consider to be an equally valid form of Jewish eating, just like every form of Jewish eating that every single one of you do. Okay, you'll notice that when you read the Torah and you get to the verse, do not cook a kid in its mother's milk, it doesn't say anything about the keeping kosher that you've seen in Fiddler on the Roof. It doesn't talk about what the families in Shtisel, how many people Shtisel? 
Netflix, Jissel, doesn't talk about that kind of kashrut either. It just says, among other things, don't cook a baby goat in its mother's milk. Eh, Torah says it three times. Jewish tradition says that the Torah doesn't waste words. It doesn't repeat itself. So if it says it three times, we're supposed to learn three different things about not eating milk and meat together from the three repetitions. And these three things we're supposed to learn were written around 200 CE for those keeping track of between 600 and 1500 years, depending on who you ask, later than the Torah verses. That's a giant gap, right? And stuff might have happened in between that changed how we interpreted those verses, and we'll come back to that. But the rabbis who are writing many, many years after the Torah verses, but still many years before we are sitting here, say that there are three things we're supposed to learn. Does anyone know what the three prohibitions that come from this verse are? You get a sticker, a happy face. I don't actually have a sticker. I, but does anyone want a, want a theoretical happy face sticker? Does anybody know what they are? Mm -hmm. Correct. So we're talking about the keeping life and death apart, and there are three things we learn, and they from this from these verses, which are do not cook milk and meat together, do not eat milk and meat together and do not benefit from, eat, from mixing milk and meat. Those are the three traditional things that Jew, Jewish tradition says we're supposed to learn. Torah doesn't say it. Rabbis a lot later say it. And we all know what we think when the rabbis tell you to do something, right? You all go, okay. All right. So there are some obvious frequently asked questions about kashrut I want to answer in clear English. Okay. First, two sets of plates. Why two sets of plates? As I just said, the prohibitions are against cooking the things together. And if you've ever had a pan where you've cooked some cheese and there's a little stuck on the outside and you can't get it out, if you fill that with meat and then you put it on the stove, boom, there's a mixture, right? So you want to keep those things apart. You want to keep your plates apart so that before you had glazed pottery, you had a soft clay pottery that would absorb flavor. So you want to have two separate sets of plates to avoid accidentally flipping back and forth. And because you don't want to eat the two, dairy and meat, together, because you don't want to blend the tastes together. That is the key. You're not supposed to taste meat and milk together. And not benefiting from them, don't invest in the company that makes Hot Pockets, right? Okay, now you said a minute, to, you said a minute to, uh, ago about taste. What's the deal with taste and why? And now I'm going to explain why, if you've ever run into someone who keeps kosher, they will often say, I'm, I have just eaten meat. I now have to wait three hours or six hours before I eat dairy. Does anybody know why? Anybody want to guess? Dentists? because you got bits of meat stuck in your teeth. And it takes a certain, Ellen gets a dental degree from this, congrats. And, you, and so your saliva takes a while to break down the bits of meat. And if you eat ice cream with the bits of meat in your teeth, you will get brisket flavored ice cream. And that is forbidden according to our tradition. Anybody know the workaround? Super obscure workaround. If you want to eat, if you observe these rules and you want to eat brisket and then you want ice cream, anybody know the one loophole? If you're super, no matter how strict you are, anybody know? No, don't write water pick. Nope, nope, not flossing, not brushing. Anybody know? Hmm? Not close. You can do it instantly if you have dentures. If you have, I had a friend, Michael Cohen. He grew up at CBI. He became very, very from. He took his 
smicha, his rabbinute exam. And we were talking one day, and he said, you know, there's this trick question. You get extra credit if you know this. So now you all know when you're ready to take the exam. Two sets of dentures, a dairy set and a meat set. And you take them out and you switch. But now I'm going to blow up. So I've explained. You're kosher, you're more kosher, you're super kosher, you're ultra kosher into the stratosphere. And I've explained there's this hierarchy of observance where as a reform rabbi, I'm way down here. And the more authentic Jews are higher up on the ladder. And now I'm going to blow up the authenticity claim. Are you ready? Okay, the Tanakh prohibits the eating of a baby goat and its mother's milk. But it does not say anything about nothing, not a word as far as I can see about mixing, about having a cheeseburger. It doesn't say anything about mixing meat and dairy. It just says baby goat and its mother's milk, which is pretty narrow. And the scholar David Kramer suggests that, remember I mentioned there were centuries between the Torah verses and the Mishnah verses where we got all the like, don't eat this and don't do that and don't do that? Well, David Kramer suggests that in between those two time periods, something important happened. We were conquered. We've been conquered a lot. But we were conquered by Alexander the Great, one of the most consequential figures of human history. And Alexander, as he was making his way across the known world, burning and pillaging and conquering and subjugating, he brought with him Greek culture. Although he's from slightly further north, he was tutored by the philosopher Aristotle. This is a guy who's, who's like, he's, he's here and he wants you to be like him. Unfortunately, he died at 33. Consequential human beings have a tendency to die at 33. He's not the only one. Some of you know the other one I'm talking about. Anyway, before he died in the year 332, he conquered Israel. And afterwards, he left us a legacy. He left us one of his generals to rule Israel after him, his general Antiochus I the law, first in a long line of Antiochid kings leading up to Antiochus the Ninth, the one in the Hanukkah story. But the Antiochids are known for trying to force Jews to assimilate to Greek cultural habits. Isn't that interesting? And one of those areas where the Antiochids pressured the Jews to assimilate was table etiquette. Now, the Torah doesn't say don't mix meat and milk. It just says don't do a kid in a, boil a kid in its mother's milk. But Greek culture did have a taboo against mixing meat and milk. Yeah. And it shows up in Greek literature. If you read the Odyssey, the Cyclops eats meat and washes it down with milk because the Cyclops is a herdsman. Herodotus, the great chronicler, the traveler of the ancient world, goes around to different cultures and coming from Greece and he goes to the hinterland and only the most removed barbaric tribes does he describe as drinking milk with their meat. The urban elite of the Hellenistic world, the ones who ruled the Jews and who said, you can rule too if you, be, if you are like us, they didn't drink milk. They drank wine. Because when you are settled in one place and you're not a herdsman or a Bedouin, you can plant vineyards. It takes a long time for vineyards to grow. And you can have a civilization with a wall around it. And all of these divisions between the herdsmen that live out there, the bumpkins, and the urban elite. Kramer makes the point that this is probably where our prohibition against mixing milk and meat comes from, from the Greeks, from an attempt to be like the dominant society. It wasn't native to Judaism at all. By avoiding simultaneous consumption of meat and dairy, a Jew would be distancing themselves from the accusation that we could ever be one of those barbarians. Should a Jew 
A Jew should we, the great dignified people, with the one God, should we eat like barbarians? Should we eat our meat with milk? Should we, yeah, sure, we can have meat at public stuff and we can have cheese and its proper place in the meal, but mixing them, oh God. If, claim, if what Kramer says is true, Moshe didn't have two sets of plates, King David didn't have two sets of plates, Breria didn't have, uh, Breria had two sets of plates. And you may ask, but Rabbi, what about those of us who choose to keep kosher? And I will say, the separation of meat and milk has been part of Jewish tradition for at least 2,300 years. I think it has earned its legitimacy if you wish to continue to do it. However, as I said during the preamble, this is not about how you choose to eat. It is about not allowing ourselves to be bullied by people who consider their Judaism to be higher than ours and more authentic than ours. It turns out when you dig far enough into that authenticity claim, this is the way it was always done, when you dig far enough, all of a sudden that claim breaks down and things is, are not as unified as they appeared. And this hierarchy of observance, where the guys in the black long coats are up here with the payas and the women with the things on there, with the, with the handkerchiefs and the shaitals are here, and modern orthodox is here, and conservative and reform recon renewal are here, all that collapses as soon as you realize that there is no unified historical truth. But within the Jewish community, we're always finding someone telling us we're bad Jews. Always, all the time. And they're telling us, people will come to you, no matter where you are on the hierarchy, you're doing it wrong. But every time someone comes to you and says, I know the true way, I know the authentic way, we should be immediately suspicious. Because they're making a claim a claim of dominance over us. That if their way is the correct way, then we have what to learn from them. That I say we should not allow ourselves to be bullied like this anymore. Judaism is complicated. There's no single way to keep kosher. There's no single way to practice Judaism. Each of us should be proud and confident in our own personal way of being Jewish. And keep our kitchens in the way that we feel comfortable keeping them. And if you happen to come across a baby goat, just try not to cook it in its mother's milk. Shabbat shalom. <laughs>